Well, I think I'll be able to see something with these. Well, yeah, you can see something, but not nearly as much as you could see if you were using the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, the Hubble Space Telescope completely changed the way I look at outer space. I mean, from the star nurseries to all those galaxies, there might be a little Earth-like planet out there somewhere. Well, that's true. But did you know that when Apollo astronauts took photographs of Earth, it really changed the way we look at ourselves? In fact, there are satellites up there all the time, imaging different parts of the Earth and studying it. Well, I could talk about looking at the Earth for a long time, but I only have about 30 minutes. Well, why only 30? Well, because this is STEM in 30. Hi, I'm Beth Wilson and I'm coming to you live from the National Air and Space Museum. Today we are in the Space Race Gallery and in this gallery we display some artifacts that are related to exploring space. One of them, one of the key ones, is the Apollo Soyuz test module. It was the first time that the Soviets and the Americans worked together in space and it was called the Handshake in Space. One of the other objects we have in this gallery is Skylab. Skylab was actually our first space station. And behind me, we have Hubble Space Telescope, and that shows us all new views of space and galaxies. This morning, we are happy to welcome Friendship Charter School is here with us this morning. Yay. They're going to help us celebrate Earth Day today and looking at Earth. Now, if you're watching online, you can uh, communicate with us directly. You can ask some questions. We've got docents here. Uh, to answer those questions, and we will also take some of your questions live. So to get us started, I have Dr. Jennifer Lavasser here, and Jennifer, we uh, want to know about looking at Earth from space, and you have a great collection of astronaut photos. So you want to tell us a little bit about those? Sure, absolutely. Astronauts have been photographing the Earth for a really long time. It goes all the way back to 1962, when John Glenn took the very first handheld camera to space. And so he went up into space in the first orbits around the Earth, and he took a bunch of really great photographs. So this is one of the very first ones he took. It looks a little fuzzy, but it's kind of hard to see out the windows. Um, and we started taking better and better cameras as the space program went on. And so you could see how he saw clouds and um, eventually scientists would study those images. Ed White went outside his spacecraft for the very first time on a spacewalk in June of 1965. And he, his image uh, of him outside the spacecraft was really important for understanding what it was like to be in space. You could see him floating, which was really cool, but also really important for how we understand ast what astronauts do. On Apollo 8 in 1968, they actually took this photograph from the moon. It was the first time people had gone around the moon, and this is called Earthrise. And what it shows is how fragile the Earth is. It's just that little ball hanging out there in the blackness of space. And so we really started to think a different way about Earth. During the Apollo 17 mission, which was the last time astronauts went to the moon, they photographed the Earth as they left Earth. And you can see the whole thing. This is the first time ever that astronauts could photograph the Earth without any shadows. And so you could see how clear it is, but also all those beautiful clouds in the atmosphere. And so this is really the beginning of a movement to think about Earth in a different way. Okay, so they took these photos with cameras. Now, I'm assuming that they're not like my iPhone that I can click on. Unfortunately, it... no. Astronauts needed a lot more equipment back, especially in the 1960s. Cameras were not digital like your phones or a little pocket camera you might have today. Astronauts started using Hasselblad cameras. Hasselblad is a Swedish camera, common in professional photography, but it's a really great camera. It's very durable. And so astronauts used it. And you can see that Hasselblad made some changes for astronauts. Astronauts often wear gloves when they're in their spacesuits. And so they made this really big tab on the side so that they could change the, the focus of the lens. Um, it also uses what's called a magazine. And this is where they keep the film. Now, Cameras are not digital, but we're not digital back then. So there's actually a roll of film inside. It was a roll of film inside here. And this particular magazine was used during most of the imaging 
um, on the way to the moon during the Apollo 11 mission. And the Apollo 11 mission is the first time people landed on the moon. So it makes this camera really, really special. So this one went up with the Apollo 11 mission. And we have a couple of photos actually from that mission from this camera. Shall we take a look at them? We do. And what's really cool about some of these photos is just how clear they are. Hasselblads were known for their quality. And so you could see these are really clear images. They're beautiful. The astronauts photographed their way uh, as they were leaving Earth. They also photographed each other. This is Michael Collins. He was the command module pilot during the mission. He was also the director of the museum when it first opened. Uh, and then you can also see things as they approach the moon, because that was their final destination, was landing on the moon. And so they started photographing it as they got closer. I think we've got some questions. We're going to start with an online question. What kinds of cameras do astronauts use to take photos in space today? Well, what's great is about 15 years ago, NASA finally transitioned to using digital cameras, and it makes it much easier to take photos. You can only get about 200 photos on this camera, but on a, ca a camera that they would use today, a digital camera, they can take thousands of photographs, and they just send them back to Earth. Sometimes you see them right away, even on a place like Twitter or Facebook. Okay. And we have an audience question. Do you have a camera question for us? Yes. Hello, my name is Jemaya, and I'm from Friendshipville Pierce. And my question is that when you know that when you have a satellite, when you take pictures, how, what kind of pictures, like what kind of camera do you use when you take pictures? What kind of, now there's a difference between these cameras and the cameras we find on satellites, Absolutely. correct? Absolutely. The cameras on satellites and even on later Apollo spacecraft were much bigger. They have a really big lens and they're able to zoom in on things that are much, much smaller. And so they can see very wide areas, but their resolution, which is how clear that image is, is much higher. We have an online question. Why is a telescope in space better than a telescope on the ground? Fantastic question. There's one major difference between using a telescope on the ground and in space, and there's the atmosphere. The atmosphere makes images from Earth not quite as good and clear as they would be from space. So when you put something like Hubble out in orbit, it can take much clearer pictures of things that are very, very far away. Thank you so much, Jennifer. No problem. Now, Jennifer showed us what happened when astronauts took photos of the Earth. Now we're going to take a look at what happens when satellites take photos of the Earth. Hey, Andrew, what are you doing? Oh, I'm looking at these satellite images of the Earth. The Earth? That's right, the Earth. That doesn't look like the kind of globe we have in a classroom. I can see clouds, but not borders. Yeah, that's right. A lot of times the globes we have in classrooms are political maps. They show different countries. This one is a physical map. It shows things like continents, oceans, uh, and forests, and deserts, and swirling clouds. It's the kind of view that we can only get from outer space. What we're seeing here, we're zooming into southern Africa at this point on the globe. And we're actually looking at something called the Okavango Delta. It's a part of southern Africa where the river, the Okavango River, flows from the upper left to the lower right, and then it slowly dries out as it enters uh, into a desert area. So this is the same picture of the same place. These two images were collected at the exact same time by the exact same satellite called Landsat 7. Why are they different colors then? Well, they're different colors because they're actually using different wavelengths of light. Wavelengths of light? Yeah. There are many different wavelengths of light. Some of them we can see with our eyes. Our eyes have retinas, and they're sensitive to red, green, and blue light. But there are other wavelengths of light that we can't see with our eyes, but they're really useful for understanding the Earth. For instance, there are a lot of wavelengths of infrared light, and that's what we see here on the image on the right. All of this red stuff shows reflectance from sunlight in near-infrared light. And do we have a machine that'll do this, or is it done once the photo's taken? No, we actually launch into space different kinds of imaging detectors that can see visible wavelengths of light, and also infrared wavelengths, and, and others. One of those machines is actually sitting uh, right here in the exhibit. It was actually a sensor called the Multispectral Scanner. It was actually launched on a series of satellites called Landsat, starting in the 1970s up through the 1980s. Five of them were launched, and they collected images that look like these. This is just a small part. What if I want something big like the state of Hawaii? If you want to show a big part of the Earth, one of the things you can do is actually take images like these that cover maybe a couple hundred miles on a side and put them together in a computer program, making what we call a mosaic. And that way you can cover large areas that show things like vegetation cover or desert areas, volcanoes, oceans, 
anything you want to see on the Earth. And why is it important that we collect these images? Well, one of the things that we're trying to do with all of these images is we look and see how the Earth changes through time. We want to understand what's on the surface of the Earth, and we do that by collecting these different wavelengths. And that's important because different kinds of things on the Earth absorb and reflect different wavelengths of light. So using these kinds of machines, we can tell the difference between forests and grasslands and deserts, any kind of vegetation and ocean cover. And then by collecting images at different times, we can see how it changes through time. Well, thanks for explaining all that to me. No problem. Well, now that we've had a chance to look at some satellites images, let's see how well you can sort them. Let's go to Stim It to win it. Hello and welcome to Stim It to Win It in today's edition. I've got six satellite pictures taken from space. And what you guys are going to do is try to sort them into two separate biomes. So I've got some friends up here. So there's one biome and a second one. You're going to try to figure out which one goes with which. But here's the hard part. I'm not going to tell them which biome is which. So I'm going to start you guys off with one right here. So take a look at your picture. Does it match this one? Do you think it comes from the same area? If it does, put it here. If not, put it over here. Go ahead. All right, great job. All right, how about you? Take a look at your picture. Outstanding. Good job. And how about your picture? Which one do you think it goes on? Do you think it matches these two or do you think it matches this one? Okay, put it on there. Okay, I'm gonna give you another picture. They do get harder. Do you think that one matches these or these? And I'm gonna give you the last one. Tough choices, where do you think it should go? All right, well, let's look at these. You guys did a phenomenal job. You got all six of them correct. Way to go. Now this, Biome one is actually desert. Over here, these are pictures of forests. Way to go. And one of the things that we can learn by looking at pictures of Earth from space are things about other planets. If you look at one of the pictures we have here, this is an alluvial fan. An alluvial fan here on Earth is created by water. We know that. But when we look at pictures of Mars, you can see these same features there. In the black and white picture, that's a crater on Mars, and you can actually see an alluvial fan there. The picture on the right is the one from Earth. We know on Earth that was formed by water, so we can make an assumption that that same feature on Mars was formed with water thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago. So Beth, they did a great job on Stim It to Win It. Let's go back over to you. Thank you, Marty. Now, we're really lucky in Washington, D.C. We can see these sort of different environments live and in person with our friends at the Botanic Gardens, and we got a chance to visit them. I am here at the U.S. Botanic Garden. Inside are plants from all over the world. Let's go in and see what's growing on. I am standing in the middle of a jungle, in the middle of Washington, D.C. As a matter of fact, the United States Capitol is only about a thousand feet that way. This jungle and all jungles are important to me and to you. Come along with me as we find out why jungles are so important. I'm joined by Lee Koikendall, the children's education specialist here at the U.S. Botanic Gardens. Lee, tell me, why should I care about the rainforest? Well, have you ever heard the expression lungs of the planet? So we get our oxygen from plants and rainforests are huge areas that have many, many different kinds of plants in them. And so we're getting a lot of oxygen from there. But the other thing is you think of the plant diversity and animal life in a rainforest, everybody should care. 
think about this. We, every second, collectively around the world, we are losing a football-sized field of rainforest. Plants and animals we might not have even discovered yet. That's an area the size of this forest every second. Absolutely. Unbelievable. So I really should care about the rainforest. Not only should you care, but everybody should care. Whether you live near the rainforest, whether you've never been to a rainforest, they are essential to the health of our ecosystem, the health of our planet. Awesome, well thank you so much for joining us. Now, back over to Beth. Okay, so we looked at a lot of different environments so far in the whole Earth, but my question right now is why Earth Day? And to help me answer that, I have Dr. Martin Collins, who's a curator in our Space History Division. And Martin, why is Earth Day important and how did it come about? What prompted Earth Day? Take a look at this image. It helps us understand the mindset of people in the 1960s. It's a poster from that very first Earth Day event. And people were very much concerned about pollution pollution from cars, pollution from factories, pollution from airplanes. It seemed that human activity was overwhelming the environment. If you look closer at the image, you see in the background a tilting image of the U.S. Capitol. And that was an indicator that the federal government had not yet stepped up to the challenge of dealing with pollution. The result was the creation of a social movement, a grassroots movement the central idea of which was that individuals and communities could take responsibility for the environment to protect it and to conserve it. But it also required specific events and ideas to help energize this idea. And one event that happened was the setting on fire of the Cuyahoga River near Cleveland. The idea that a river, a body of water, could catch on fire let, uh, just symbolized very, very deeply how much pollution was in the environment and the effects that it had. Uh, this gained wide coverage and was an energizing moment for this idea of, of creating an Earth Day. Also important was the ideas that Jennifer just shared with you a little while ago. The idea of seeing the planet from space. Why was that important? It helped cement the idea that Earth was finite, that this blue ball that hung in space was something that we needed to protect for all of us. So what happened on Earth Day itself? There were many, many people who were involved. One part of it was marches in major cities across the United States. The image that you are seeing here is of New York City, people flocking down one of the major roads of, the, of Manhattan, uh, in which everyone was standing forth to saying there is something that we can do about the environment. The other part of Earth Day was something that was called teach-ins. And these happened at, at universities around the country, at high schools, uh, in communities in which the idea of individual and community responsibility, of taking action to do things to preserve the environment was what was taught. And that legacy, that core idea, was something that became uh, uh, central to all subsequent Earth Days and is what we understand today when we think about Earth Day that we as individuals and as communities can do things to protect the environment. Thank you so much Martin. Shall we answer some questions? Certainly. Let's take an online question. When did Earth Day become recognized worldwide? Almost immediately. Uh, it was, uh, from its inception, people in different countries were concerned about pollution issues. Uh, the, the people, like uh, when you think about that whole Earth image, the idea of seeing Earth from space, that was not just a concern here in the United States, but from, from countries and individuals around the world. So from its very beginning, uh, it had this flavor of an international event rather than just a national event. And you have an Earth Day question, don't you? You had a good one. You see that mark right there? Go ahead, <laughs> ask your question. What was your Earth Day question? Who started Earth Day? Who started Earth Day, well, Martin? There, there, is, there is not really one single individual. Uh, it was many, many individuals who were for participants. There were some people who were politicians who were involved, but more there were what were known as activists, people who saw this issue of pollution and protection of the environment as a critical issue of their time. Uh, and it was sort of the binding together and getting together uh, that really made Earth Day happen. And we have another audience question. You have a good Earth Day question. How, why is Earth Day so important to many people? Well, that's a good question because I think it affects so many people in an immediate way. 
Uh, think about your own potential efforts to contribute to Earth Day. Think about what you do in terms of recycling, say, of plastic bags or plastic bottles. Uh, things that may concern you about the food you eat or the cars you drive. Uh, all of these things affect us in a very, very individual way. And I think that's why it has become important and has, has created such energy over time. And we have another online question. What can I do today to help protect the Earth? Well, it depends uh, on where you are and, and how you live. But as I was just sort of outlining, a critical thing is just looking at your own individual habits uh, and how they relate to issues of protecting the Earth. Again, things like uh, whether or not you use plastic bags, what you do with uh, 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 paper, whether you recycle it, uh, plastic bottles, all of these things on an individual level uh, contribute to protecting the environment on a larger level. Thank you so much, Martin. And we're going to go back to the Botanic Garden to take a look at another ecosystem. I'm back and I've moved into the desert area and I'm joined by Ari Novi, the director of the U.S. Botanic Gardens. It's really hot and dry in here, but there are some amazing plants. How do these all grow in here? Well, thank you so much for having me, and it's really fun to be here in the desert with you today. Um, we often think of the desert as kind of a barren uh, wasteland full of sand, but really plants have found amazing ways to, to make life happen. And they're dealing with uh, the really twin challenge of extreme temperatures, especially heat, but also a real lack of moisture um, and precipitation. And so they have wonderful adaptations like succulent thick stems for storing water, um, very thick skin that makes sure that they, they don't evaporate water and lose it um, during the process of photosynthesis, as well as highly reduced leaves um, and a lot of anti-herbivory um, compounds and thorns and things like that as well. Now there's some really interesting plants in here. Can you tell me about some of them? Absolutely. Um, one of my favorites is called the giant Stapelia, or Stapelia gigantea, and it's really neat because not only is it succulent and able to live in the, um, in the, in the arid environment, but also it's got to think about pollination. It's got to think about, well, you know, I've got to live, but I also have to take advantage of these, these insects that are going to allow me to reproduce. And it does that by producing this really ugly, horrific flower. Um, looks kind of like the, the really ugly alien in the, in the movie Predator. Um, and it not only is really ugly, but it uh, smells really, really bad, and it attracts these flies that basically like rotting flesh. Um, and so it's able to take advantage not only of, of, um, of, of the desert conditions to live, but also of the insects that live in the desert. That sounds horrible, but <laughs> awesome at the same time. What other ones do you like in here? I love the barrel cacti. Um, barrel cacti are kind of the, the quintessential cacti. They're large, they have big thorns. Um, and uh, they're really interesting because they're all swollen. They're, they're really a giant swollen stem, and, and that's a, a mechanism for the cactus to conserve water. When, when it does rain, it often pours in the desert, just very infrequently. And so they're able to suck up a whole bunch of water and hold on to it so they can use it later on, even when there's a very, very little rainfall. Interesting. Now, there's another plant that kind of grows in this area, but you don't have it in this room. That's absolutely right. Should we go take a look at absolutely. it? Absolutely. Let's go. All right. This plant's something that we can grow at home, right? Yes, absolutely. Um, this is aloe, or aloe vera is the Latin name. Um, it's a plant that a lot of us are very familiar with because you can buy it um, pretty much at any garden center, and a lot of people do have it in their homes, both because it's beautiful, but also because um, when you have a burn or a sunburn, the, the, the sap or the juice inside the plant is a really wonderful salve against those burns. So you just can grow this plant at home um, whenever you need to. You snap off a little piece of it, kind of rub it on you, and, uh, and you're kind of good to go. So you've got your medicine right there on your counter at home growing in this plant? It's right there for you. And uh, in fact, in addition to being used as a burn uh, medicine, a lot of uh, traditional cultures also use it as an actually potent laxative, but, but I'll warn you because it is truly potent. Okay. If you'd like to learn more about medicinal plants here at the U.S. Botanic Garden, go to the STEM in 30 website where we're going to post a short video showing you some of these other medicinal plants. Thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Thank you for having us. Now back to Beth. So we've taken a look at Earth from afar, but now we're going to ask you what can you do to help the environment? And to answer that question, we have some friends from Smithsonian Gardens. Marty? Like Beth said, today is a day for action. We want you guys to be yeah, able to do something. Job. And this is something that you guys can do in your backyards. And every little bit counts, you know? Everything from recycling one water bottle to making a container garden helps our environment. So I'm joined today by Christine Price Abelow, and you're a horticulturalist at the Smithsonian Gardens. Tell us a little, about, a little bit about what these guys are doing. Sure, these guys are helping us plan up some container gardens. Uh, the great thing about containers is it's something you can do anywhere. 
whether you have sun or shade or a small space like a balcony, a deck or a patio, or you want to put them out in your regular landscape, you can add a great splash of color or bring in um, pollinators to your garden by planting these containers up. And the ones we're doing today are specifically pollinator friendly containers. Um, you can see the guys here, they're planting up these uh, beautiful flowers here. These are actually pentas. They attract hummingbirds uh, because of the red color. Um, we've also got some other samples of containers over here. We've got a, one that's yellow and white and silver. Uh, most of those things bloom in the er early evening or early morning hours when uh, moths are out. The white colors and the silver color foliage attracts moths for that one. That's another type of pollinator. And the large containers beside me here, these are uh, bee and butterfly friendly plants. Bees and butterflies see colors differently than people do. They uh, actually see tracks or patterns on those petals that guide them in to the nectar source when they come in to feed and then the pollen sticks to them and then they take it to the next plant and transfer it over. So we've got the butterfly and bee containers there. And this last one here is a hummingbird container. It's, uh, if you notice, it's all featuring red, full, uh, red flowers on here. A lot of tubular shapes where they'll put a, come in and land on the plants and then uh, stick their little beak down in there, get the nectar and bring it out on them that way. So one thing with container gardening, depending on uh, what kind of pollinators you want to attract, you just want to make sure you have a full sun location so you can get lots of butterflies, bees, things like that uh, visiting your garden. And this is something that you can do even if you don't have a big yard, right? Right, any space, a balcony, a patio, a deck, anything like that. Awesome. Indoors now, too. Now you guys are, the Smithsonian Gardens is sponsoring a competition, correct? Right, well we have our annual Garden Fest event coming up that celebrates National Public Garden Day. Uh, it's Friday, May 8th, and we usually have a container contest associated with the event. We invite the public to come in and uh, bring in their containers with them. We display them in the Haup Garden that day and have a, a friendly little judging or competition among the containers for different categories. So if you'd like to participate, there's information on our website that you can uh, look up online and check out the event and come on out. Great. Guys, you're doing a great job with this. There's just one thing that we need to add to it. We add that right there. This looks perfect <laughs> now. So Beth, let's go back over to you. We have some more questions coming in. So we've got an online question. How does looking into space help us better understand Earth? Martin, do you that want to take this? <laughs> uh, yes, uh, I think the, the, the question might be turned a little bit to say, how does looking, at, looking from space at Earth uh, help us? And I think the uh, stories that uh, Jennifer and Andy Johnston shared with us help us do that. Those satellites provide us a basis for kind of understanding changes in forests, changes in deserts, as was pointed out, uh, changes in all the ocean surfaces. Uh, so they provide a kind of critical database for kind of knowing how the Earth is faring and how it's changing. And that's all the time we have. Thank you very much, Christine, Martin, and Jennifer. I'd also like to thank our sponsor, Boeing. And we hope that you can join us next month on May 20th, where we will be looking at living and working in space. Hope to see you soon.